welcome everyone we are here for our second phase of uk ayn eco peace cafe and we have new faces here so i would like to introduce uk ayn eco peace cafe is an online platform for having dialogues on various topics including environment peace building and social justice so i would like to welcome all of you to our session uh let's counter hate speech today we will discuss more about how to counter hate speech and how can we act uh, on uh topics related to hate speech and we have a wonderful uh, speaker here emina she is joining us from bosnia before introducing her we can have a short ice breaking and please feel free to unmute and introduce yourself and please share one word which you would like to describe yourself for example brave or graceful so i will start with myself i am greshma i am joining today from india and from the south of india kerala and i would like to describe myself as graceful and i normally call like graceful greshma so i am also the founder of eco peace teen cafe so i would like to pass to Eda. Thank you, Krishma. Um, this is Eda Molla. Um, I'm originally from Greece, but I'm based in London, UK. I think I can consider myself as a Londoner because it's been eight years. Now I work as um, interfaith youth coordinator for Religions for Peace UK, and um, um, I would consider myself as a kind person. Um, so kindness, um, that's the word that I pick, and I'd like to pass it to Emina. Thank you, Eda. Uh, greetings to all. Uh, my name is Emina, uh, and I'll be here with you um, during the session. And um, the word that I would like to connect with me is energetic, like energetic Amina. I'm like always full of energy and I don't know where this energy comes from, but um, I'm like always all around the place. So uh, energetic Amina for hopefully it will stay energetic until the end of the session. And um, I'm going to pass the floor to Aparna. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Aparna. I work as development officer at Interfaith Scotland. So um, as you can tell that um, autumn is clearly here in Scotland now. So we have started wearing jumpers. And <clears throat> I, what word? I would say friendly. Uh, I'm a very, very, very chatty, very friendly person. So I'm always up to chat with people. So yeah, I'll go with that. And I will um, I will pass to Cindy. Hi, my name is Cindy. I'm the chair of RFP UK. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. And if I choose a word to describe myself, I would probably choose compassionate. Um, there are so many things that we need to pay attention to. And with that attention comes empathy and with that empathy comes compassion and I'm very happy that Amina's joined us today it's a very important day for us and I wish that everyone would pay extra attention to what we can do after we hear what she says thank you very much I would pass it on to Ono hello my name is Ono uh, I'm from Germany I work as a public employee and usually I don't have much contact with hate speech, but friends of me do. So I thought I should learn a bit about it. You can pass it too. Oh, right. Um, I need to choose a word. I choose the word calm. And I, um, um, who is still missing? I think Yamila has not yet said anything. Yeah. So I choose Yamila. Thank you, Ono. Uh, I am Jamila. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm retired because uh, I, didn't, I don't work anymore for a few years now, uh, but I'm very interested in the topic. Um, I was born in Tunisia, 
I live in London. I am now in Egypt. So as you can see, I'm quite active and I travel quite a bit. And uh, I would describe myself as generous, Jamila. Um, thanks, Jamila. And Amila, can you, um, can you speak or please feel free to share um, it on the chat? Yeah, so we have um, like so many words now, kind, compassion, energetic, friendly, calm. And, and yeah, so uh, so with all these beautiful words, let's hear more about speech and more about words. And so today uh, we have Emina here. She's the program coordinator of Youth for Peace, Bosnia. And she's also the member of International Youth Interfaith Youth Network of Religion for Peace. And we welcome you, Emina, to this wonderful session. So today we have like 25 minutes of interactive session. And then we will go for a breakout session. There you can also explore more about uh, how to counter hate speech. And then we will be back to the main room and have a short reflection. So this is the structure of uh, today's session. So, Emina, now the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Greshma. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. So, uh, I'm going to share a kind of a presentation that I prepared for you. Uh, so, today we're going to speak about hate speech. And uh, I'm going to share the roadmap of the session with you so you know what is actually expecting you during the session. We're going to talk about what is hate speech. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into the origins of hate speech. I'm going to show you some examples of hate speech, and these are just for the educational purposes. Uh, and then we'll talk about ways of addressing hate speech, and then you'll go to breakout rooms with one um, question uh, or one example where you're going to discuss it. And then we have Q&A uh, part. So to start with the, let's say, definition of hate speech, I didn't want to put you one definition and tell you this is hate speech because it's quite hard to define hate speech. So I decided to make a Padlet for you. And in this Padlet, you will have three definitions of hate speech. And I will give you five minutes to read them. And then you can react to those definitions, either to like them or to comment on them. I'm going to be sending you the link uh, to the definitions. Uh, actually to the Padlet and you can uh, just uh, go to the Padlet and then um, actually I'm, I'm just sorry because my laptop is a bit not cooperating with me now so bear with me a little bit. Um, so you can actually scan the QR code which I'm going to show now on the screen. Just a bit. And then go to the Padlet. Do you see the QR code here? So if you have your phones, it would be good to scan it and then go to the... Go to the Padlet. If the QR code doesn't work, let me just try reaching out to the to the link. I was able to get it from QR code, no issues. That's good. And now I'm actually also sending it to you in the chat. So if somebody cannot go to the QR code, you can actually go directly to the Padlet also on your laptops. There you go. It's inside the chat. And now I'm gonna share the screen with the Padlet so we can actually see whatever is happening in the Padlet at the moment. I do hope that you'll be able to see the Padlet very soon. Sharing the screen, okay. So here's the Padlet and I do hope that you could either use the QR code or the link. And we have three definitions, and now I'm giving you your five minutes to read them and to react to them.
I'm very happy to see that you are already interacting with the definitions and that I'm seeing some comments on them. I see that the first definition is easy to understand. Um, I'm not seeing who commented but because it says anonymous, but still it's very good that you're interacting with the definitions. The second one, um, I see a comment that it's very technical definition, but very useful for probing an issue in a judicial way, absolutely. And then um, somebody says, I would say all the vulnerable groups. Yes, this definition, in my opinion, is a bit too uh, narrow. Uh, and sometimes uh, people ask me like, and sometimes people actually ask me, uh, you know, why just anti-Semitism here? Why not other forms of, of hatred as well? Um, and then the last one, uh, um, somebody says this definition is confusing. So I would actually like to discuss it. It would be really nice to discuss why it is confusing. Uh, and somebody says that includes all of the above definitions and it can happen in person or on social media too. So uh, if anybody has any other comment that you would like to uh, share with us now, like if you want to unmute and tell something about the definitions or say like, I like the most, the first, second or third definition, uh, it would be really nice. Uh, if not, then I will just wrap up uh, about the definitions and tell you a little bit more about hate speech. So if somebody wants to uh, comment, please, please feel free to unmute yourself and tell us like, why do you like the most one first, second or third definition? Um, I just found something interesting to comment on is that um, only the <clears throat> first one um, specifies the physical or mental disability, mm -hmm. which is, I think, quite, uh, uh, especially when it comes in sort of, uh, uh, like, I think it's quite often, uh, I mean, it's less often now, I guess, but I think it's still sad that that is also has to be included and it's not in the second one, which is why, I mean, I noticed somebody said the vulnerable groups, I think that would be a much better way of including it as well. So, so uh, that's there. Whereas in the uh, last uh, uh, definition, the other identity factor, I found that very interesting because that is a good way. It's like the second one, the suggestion about vulnerable groups. It's quite a good way of making sure of being inclusive of anything. I mean, religion, ethnicity, all that is mentioned, but then there are like the uh, identity factors and things like that. It can be very small things, which is not included in any broad category or doesn't have any specific name. And it's good to have some, uh, I think in any sort of definition listing these sort of things, it's good to have a, a phrase that can go for a broader category rather than just specific categories as well to uh, include that as well. Thank you so much, Aparna. You put it very well that uh, it's very important that the definition stay, let's say, open so we can either add other categories or just put something where we can actually talk about other categories. As you said, in the first definition, uh, we have uh, a physical or mental disability and others. Uh, and then in the second definition, which I said, it's quite narrow and it's pretty old definition. It's from the 90s, actually, from the European uh, Committee of Ministers, uh, uh, Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers. And then this one is pretty new, 2019, uh, which is from the UN. Actually, they don't call it definition. They call it like uh, the way how they hate, see hate speech or let's say the draft definition, because there is no universal definition what hate speech is. Uh, because uh, there are like two ways to see hate speech, either very legally, which the second definition is more like uh, prone to, or seeing it from the perspective of the people who are targets of hate speech. Because these definitions, when you see it as a target of hate speech, you can see it's more like uh, inclusive. There are more categories that are inside because many different identity factors can be reason for hate speech, can be actually uh, why somebody is targeted by hate speech. Uh, so. I don't have any preferred definition of hate speech, to be honest, but I always go with this uh, uh, from the UN because to me it's quite uh, broad and it can encompass many different identities. 
but uh, I think it's important that we just, uh, you know, keep open minded when it's about hate speech, because it's changing every day. And like many people who are working on different uh, positions inside, like uh, different institutions in EU or in other countries are coming up with new different terms, because unfortunately, uh, you know, hatred is just finding its new ways to, to manifest itself. So it's really important to keep updated the definitions, but also the frameworks. But I see that Cinda raised her hand. So Cinda, please go ahead. Right. Hi, I, I, I realize that we are, we are talking about hate speech, but the thing is, it doesn't stop at speech. The whole point of speech is that it goes on to incite violence you know, at the very least, because how else, why, why would people just talk? Um, we keep saying that we need to take action. And these people who, who are the recipients of, on the receiving end of these, these you know, speech, these hate speech things, um, they take action. And now whether they are lone wolves or they are organized, they bring damage. Um, either the damage is to... Um, a community or individuals, it's still damage. So we are seeing that speech is no longer just confined in speech. It it it's linked to action. But because there is this general acceptance that we have free speech, that people are saying that it's okay. You know, it's just that's how I think, and and I have to, um, I have the right or the freedom to to say that so that's one thing that we need to park at the back of our minds we're not just talking about speech of course and the second mm -hmm. thing is when when they say that, that you know when the hate, hate speech is is being doled out to people who are vulnerable or who are actually impressionable like younger people um the more they they hear it the more it becomes uh, normal it's normalized and that what you and I consider as hate speech may may have been already normalized to a certain extent that it's almost acceptable because you have your freedom. So that is a, a very fine point that when we are tackling hate speech, as we know um, what it can do, that may be the action that we shape ourselves to go into later on. Might that not take on the shape of of beyond speech form, which is hate. Uh, you know, the, how do we tackle that? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Cinda. Uh, you're definitely right because hate speech is mostly something what precedes hate crimes. Like not every hate speech becomes hate crime, <laughs> thank God, but uh, almost every occurrence of hate crime was preceded by hate speech. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna share now the Canva part with a with a presentation, uh, and um, I'm gonna just give you shortly a uh, few uh, let's say uh, let's put it this way like criteria for hate speech because it's hard to have like one definition, but there are some criteria that were developed uh, by uh, and I took these criteria from Friedrich Emit who did uh, extensive research on, on hate speech. So uh, I'm just gonna shortly tell you about it. So this is a speech that targets a group or individual as a member of the group. So you have to be you know, targeted by certain group, uh, let's say uh, group identity. The message expresses hatred. The speech causes harm. That, that can be physical harm, can be also psychological harm. It doesn't have to manifest physically that you can say it's harm, but maybe it can manifest like on psychological harm to people who are targets of hate speech. The speaker intends harm. So this is really in the intention of the speaker. And this is a tricky thing with the hate speech because you can, it's really hard to prove the intention. Like, was it really the intention to, to harm you? And this is legally speaking, really hard to, uh, to somehow... Um, prove the speech intense uh incites mal malicious actions beyond beyond the speech itself this is what cinda already said uh the speech is either public or is directed at a member of the group so it has to be public it has to be somewhere that many people see that, you know it has to be somewhere that either social media or some public speeches or i don't know a graffiti on on a mosque or a graffiti on a synagogue or any other place so it's really public so it somehow incites more violence because people can see it 
the context makes violence possible. It's really important to think of the context because what is really, let's say, harmful in my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, certain kinds of hate speech and certain kinds of, um, I don't know, actions might not be that harmful in, in UK because we don't have the same context. We don't have the same history, the same cultural context, the same religious, uh, let's say, context, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then this speech has no redeeming purpose. So the speech itself, it's just there to harm. There's no redeeming purpose of the speech. So really remember these eight, eight criteria when you are thinking is something hate speech or is not something hate speech. And I will make this presentation available to the organizers so they maybe can send it to you after this, uh, the workshop. So I told you that not all hate speech is potentially dangerous, but uh, is potentially dangerous. Not all hate speech is equally dangerous. So I'm showing you an example here. Both of these cases are hate speech. Immigrants have historically had an evil influence. This is hate speech already because you are already uh, putting one group of people, those are immigrants, and saying that they had an evil influence. So are putting them somehow and speaking against them and putting them in the group that they are, let's say, evil people. So if this is said by a 16 year old on a personal blog that is read by a few people, it's bad. But it is worse if a prime minister says this in a, a podcast on all major news sites. Why? Because the prime minister has much larger audience. And also the prime minister is sort of an authority inside the country. And he can actually mobilize the crowd. He can mobilize the people so people can actually go into action, as Cinda said, like not just um, speech that he's using, but also he's moving people towards violent actions and incitement to, to certain harm that can be done to people of immigrant origin. So there is bad hate speech, but there is worse hate speech. And it really depends on the context and on the, on the person who is um, actually uh, using, sorry, using hate speech. Uh, I just want to uh, shortly say about the impact of hate speech, uh, because I want to tell you that not all hate speech is equally dangerous. And thank God, not all hate speech becomes hate crime. But in the worst cases, like Nazi Germany, like former Yugoslavia and like Rwanda, where first victims were vilified, denigrated, and then humanized by politicians in the broader society, then, you know, the crimes, the hate crimes happened. So first you, people were people, let's say these, uh, you know, people in power, they were preparing the terrain for the really, really bad crimes, including crimes against humanity and genocide. And then afterwards, they were executed. So we need to think of it. Not all hate speech will lead to these crimes, thank God. But why risk? Why taking risk? Why, you know, having this kind of atmosphere in the society that can lead to these crimes if we can slowly, step by step, actually prevent it? So also some uh, examples come from Myanmar, where Facebook was used to spread hateful messages and then real life violence was documented. The attack on Muslims in Christchurch in New Zealand was also preceded by hate speech and by hateful manifesto by the uh, by the guy who committed the attacks. And the same happened to the Jews in Pittsburgh, United States in 2018. So we have a lot of these occurrences happening and we just have to carefully think of them and think like how hate speech preceded these hate crimes and how hate speech doesn't just stay on, stay on speech, it actually goes into the action. And now I promise you to show you some examples. Uh, do you have any comments to what I have been saying until now? If not, I'm gonna go really quickly into the examples. Okay. So the examples are here for the educational purposes. They might be a bit disturbing, so I do hope uh, that they won't disturb you too much, but it's really important that we know what we are talking about by using the examples and seeing how hate speech looks like. So here I have two examples for you. Uh, and on the one on the left side, at least on the left side on my <laughs> in, from my perspective, we have a tweet. And um, I'm sorry, I see that somebody is commenting maybe in chat. Oh, somebody came. Uh, so we have one uh, tweet saying, not all choices are hard. Uh, do you wanna save a rhino or you wanna save the Negro? Sorry for this, using this word. And we see very obviously that the thumb, uh, that the finger is on the save the rhino. So can somebody tell me why do you consider this is hate speech?
Okay, I'll just briefly explain. So we have already comparing humans to animals. Like we are comparing human beings to animals. Save the rhino. We have the word Negro, which is a slur, which is a you know very very bad word used to uh, label people of African American descent. And then we have the thumb obviously indicating that we should save the rhino instead of saving a, a human being, which is already inciting the violence against the people of African-American descent. Then we have keep Syrians out. This is obviously calling for people of Syrian background uh, to go out of certain country. So if we are... Uh, trying to push people away from the country we say like okay good but you cannot live here so this is already uh calling for the violence calling for uh, other people to act on it and somehow push the people outside and then we have two more exa uh, two more examples here uh sorry uh so we have something saying virus which is indicating the israeli flag and the israelis and we have the vaccine with a Hitler and taking into the context what was happening with the Jews in 1940s during the Second World War and what Hitler was doing, we can clearly see here that we need to use Hitler or the vaccine to wipe out the virus, which is considered as uh, here as Israelis uh, an Israeli flag and Jews. On the other hand, we have another example. Uh, the question is, this is in my language, but the question is, does anybody know what to do with all of these migrants here? So there is Hitler raising his hand. So we have, see the transfer of the narrative of how uh, what was happening in the 1940s, what was happening in the Second World War during the Holocaust. So we are transferring the narrative that we should put migrants in the concentration camps, that we should deal with them the way how Jews were systematically killed during the Second World War. So a transfer of the narrative and hate speech again. And very quickly, why people engage in hate speech? Uh, so some people are just like, out of fun, thrill seeking. So they just use hate speech because it's funny for them and they are not aware what hate speech can cause. Some are defending their cause, their community. They are like, uh, you know, some kind of crusaders defending my own community, my own religion, my own nationality. So I have to wipe out everybody who's not part of my community. Sometimes it's re retaliation, hate for hate, you know, using hate speech to diffuse hate speech, which is really not a good um, strategy. And then you have the mission offenders, those who are like, really, let's say, uh, you know, thinking that their uh, community is the best, that their religion is the best, that their nation is the best, that their ethnic group is the best. So nobody, everybody who's like on the other side, on the other group is completely like not worthy of living. And then you also have prejudices, stereotypes, lack of knowledge about other groups, lack of encounters and meetings, indoctrination, it's out of education, and of course, lack of awareness, what hate speech can cause. So all of this is somehow uh, causes of hate speech, because hate speech is a symptom of, of much more and much deeper issues that we have in the society. So hate speech is a symptom of prejudices and stereotypes we have, lack of knowledge we have, ignorance about other people, uh, hatred that already exists towards other people. So we just find hateful messages as a way to express all of this, which is, let's say, uh, cause and hate speech is a symptom of it. So we have to treat hate speech as a symptom of deeper issues that we have in the society. And finally, what we can do, uh, I know we are a bit short with time, but uh, just bear with me uh, because I need to show you this so you can discuss the example in the breakout rooms. What you can do, you can report hate speech to authorities in cases that there are the laws that are treating hate speech in your countries. I know, for example, for Germany, you have really strong hate, uh, hate speech law. So uh, sometimes it's even criticized uh, by, by those freedom of speech fighters. Then you can report hate speech to social media. It's really easy. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or X, how it's called now, they have really good community standards and very well explained what con constitutes hate speech there. And even like very, very well uh, into inside uh, the characteristics, like those protected characteristics, those uh, identity factors that are uh, somehow considered as protected characteristics by those social media. You can do fact checking and debunking. So you can fact check that what people are uh, writing. So it's really important to be media literate and information literate in order to uh, make certain kind of fact check and debunk the myths that are often behind hate speech. 
You can give friendly warning to the author. Sometimes this can be really useful if you know the person who's spreading hate speech, so you can talk to this person. Showing and invoking empathy is really important uh, to try to show empathy towards the people who are targets, but also towards the perpetrators, because uh, research showed that uh, the best way how to diffuse hate speech is actually to show empathy towards also the perpetrator, to understand what lies behind the hate speech. It's really important that we don't label perpetrators and tell them you're you know, idiots, you're uneducated, you don't know anything, because this is just going to make things worse. Then uh, you can use humor and satire. There is a lot of memes out there um, on hate speech, on uh, somehow, uh, let's say, um, uh, let's say somehow ridiculing hate speech, but in a humorous and satire way, but not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, using the slurs against the people who are perpetrators. And finally, counter and alternative narratives. And I want to show you one. Uh, alternative narrative that I was trying to create together with my colleagues. We created a no hate speech rule poster because we are a group of young people coming from diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds. So we decided to dive into 11 different religious traditions and find uh, uh, these uh, supporting quotations from the religious traditions or uh, sacred books that are supporting good speech, that are supporting speech that is like uplifting people and not putting them down. So we did a campaign for the World Interfaith Harmony Week uh, and we had quite a good uh, response from the people. Uh, and you know, you can use this no hate speech rule poster in any kind of uh, situation or if you want to, uh, you know, create your own narrative or if you want to speak to people how religion can help diff in diffusing hate speech because very often religion is used for hate speech unfortunately so we need to work on shifting this narrative that religion can be a part of problem but is also a part of the solution. And here I will send you later the links to these videos because these videos are somehow representing how some people are fighting against hate speech uh, either using uh, graffiti to cover hate art or uh, using uh, or doing like experiments and showing that we are we are all people no matter of our background uh, or using uh, let's say certain kinds of uh, experiments to show what we actually share that there is much more that we share rather than what we uh, what is dividing us so these are all somehow examples that you can use maybe in your own communities to bring people together. Uh, but I will send you the links to these videos when we come back from the breakout room so you will have the opportunity to see these and uh, learn more from it. And finally, breakout rooms. Uh, so for the breakout room, uh, Edda will send you to breakout rooms. <laughs> and I don't know how many breakout rooms uh, we will have, but uh, I will send you this task uh, in the chat as well. So your task will be to read this example and then discuss what would you do in this situation, taking into account your context, taking into account what I just told you, what can be done when hate speech is uh, happening, and also taking into account your previous experiences, uh, what you can actually do to, let's say, somehow diffuse the situation that happened. So um, I'm actually sending you this now to the uh, chat, and um, I will kindly ask Ada to, uh, help us with the breakout rooms. Thank you, Amina. Uh, please uh, send that question and I'll create mm -hmm. three rooms, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm creating them now. And if you have any comments until what was said now, please feel free to ask or to comment uh, until we, we have some time to prepare the, the breakout rooms. I sent you the task uh, or the situation inside the chat. So um, how long is the breakout room, please? It will be 15 minutes okay. long. Okay. I will send a one minute warning uh, before you come back to the main room. Wishing you have good discussions. I'm creating it now. Thank you. Um, and Emina, there is one question in the chat. The poster is great. Would it be possible to translate it to different languages? Or uh, are there any translations? We can discuss that when we come back from the breakout rooms. Good. Okay. I will also join the room. Yeah. Uh, if you wish. Okay, I'm going. Okay. See you. See you in a bit.
and ada it would be great if we can pause pause the recording so yes team we got they should be joining in five hello welcome back Tima, I didn't know you were Fatima. Hi, Fatima. <laughs> well, it's such a Hi. nice surprise. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really happy to see you all here tonight. Uh, we are very glad to see you too. Okay. Um, I'm so sorry that I dragged you back to the main room. I could see the microphones going really like burning on fire. So very interesting very interested finding out what was the discussions about but i mean i don't know if you want to reflect on the question that we had on the mm -hmm. chat mm -hmm. yeah please I'll, I'll i'll do a short reflection on the question in chat and uh i'm just gonna say that i also had a very very good discussion with jamila in uh with aparna and uh, we needed more time definitely uh, but the thank you, Anna, first for your comment on the poster. Uh, that is great. We don't have the translations, but it's definitely possible to do translation in, other, in different languages. For example, if you would like to have one, uh, because it's very cold, we are from Germany. So if you would like to have a German translation of it, I would be happy to share a poster with you. I can send it to you. Maybe yeah. you can just leave your email uh, and um, I can send the, the, the poster to you. So it, it's more than okay to make translations as long as you just cite the the source of the of the poster and for us it's important to share spread the word about it i think uh, it's a it's a good source good resource for uh, countering hate speech so uh if it's translated into other languages you know the the more the merrier so uh i can share the poster with you just leave us the leave me the email and uh it can be also translated if you would like to do that I would like uh, the poster as well, just to as part of our resources. Yeah, absolutely. I'll share it with you. Ono, would you like to comment or say something? Oh yes, uh, I, that is great. I will send you my email, and then when I have translated it, if I manage to do that, I will send it back to you so that you have the translation as well. Please, thank you so much. That would be wonderful. Okay, so I think Edda, you are muted. <laughs> I always do that. I'm so sorry. Uh, I just put my email address in the chat. Uh, either you want to connect further with Amina or if you would have any further questions or uh, like this translation, please email me and I will put uh, each of you in touch with her. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, people, I heard that, as Edda said, microphones were burning. <laughs> so I do hope they were burning like because of the positive things that were happening in the breakout rooms. So uh, it would be nice to to hear some reflections on what were, you were talking about in the breakout rooms about the example, but I'm sure you were tackling other issues besides the example, because I definitely was talking with Jamila and Aparna on many other things related to hate speech, but also related to the things happening in their communities. Um, so is there anyone who would like to uh, reflect on the, maybe the other breakout room group, uh, what you were talking about and uh, to tell us a little bit more about why the microphones were burning there? Anyone? Shall I pick a name? No, no. Um, Amina, tells us, uh, tell us your your discussion first. <laughs> okay, Aparna, would you like to tell us, or I should just keep speaking because you were you were saying some really nice things there. So I would love to hear from you if you are up to that. Yeah, um, no issues. Uh, well, I won't keep it as long as we did it on our breakout rooms, but uh, <clears throat> uh, one. Well, one thing was we had experienced something similar at the temple here. It was graffiti or egging or something. This was before I had joined. And uh, the, a soft option that was cons that came out as a solution was to just get CCTV cameras for the outside of the, you know, the compound area. 
which was what the police had suggested. Generally, it's a pretty nice neighborhood. So um, we've got really nice neighbors. And one of the things we do now is that we have very good relations with the local people. So like, for example, the, there's a church whose minister is very friendly with us. And, you know, we invite him for Diwali and he invites us for Christmas. And there's a mosque as well. The imam invites us for like iftar sometimes, you know, um, for Eid meals and things like that. So we are all connected within the faith community. So <clears throat> often the, uh, so one of the things we found, uh, we felt was would be very encouraging is for others to see is, when they see the local people, like we have the local counselors or the minister coming, walking into our temple, just having that view of, you know, somebody who's of uh, local importance coming to this uh, temple will de-alienize the image of the temple. So they feel like, oh, okay, so our minister is going there, you know, so it's, it, it should be a perfectly normal place. Then that sort of an idea would come into their head. So that's sort of a long-term thing, I know, and it's not always uh, the thing, but having that open image of friendliness with everybody who lives around the place of worship, that sort of local community cohesion, showing that, you know, you're also just part of the community sort of thing, uh, just give us a sense of an image of normality. And therefore, you know, you're not, you, you then people just start to, accept you as part of you know the environment you know the landscape sort of thing and the other thing was uh, <clears throat> uh mina was saying some uh, when she said you know making sure that the uh, uh, the voice of the uh, uh hate, hate speech protesters they are louder and then there was this incident that happened in Scotland in May in Elgin, where um, they were turning the first hotel into a place for the place of stay for the asylum seekers and refugees. And then the day that it was supposed to happen, there's this man in the UK who models himself after Hitler and, you know, promotes a lot of hate speech against um, immigrants. And he was going to come to a protest there of with like 30, 40 people and in response, the city, the village, the town of Elgin and surrounding areas, a hundred people gathered there. And every time he opened his mouth to say something, you know, some hate speech or something like that, immediately the local people would just chant, well, refugees are welcome, refugees are welcome. So rather than, <clears throat> rather than, you know, shut, asking him to keep quiet or rather than, you know, telling him, you know, be rude comments about him, they just made sure that his hate speech would just wouldn't be heard and you know, making sure that they drown it out, so that it was a very peaceful way of uh, approaching that issue, and it was a great, great success. Thank you, Aparna. And uh, this is, as I told her, like this is such such a great example that that ha that was happening, and it's important that we know about ex examples and talk about them. Because people in other communities might learn something from it and they might, you know, organize something similar in order to diffuse hate speech in their community. So this is what what the people came up with. It's like just brilliant. You know, you don't actually directly counter him. You don't tell him anything. You don't call him. You don't blame him, shame him or whatever. You don't put him on a pedestal of like uh, shame. But you are just louder than the than the voice of hate. So this is this is important that our voices, voices of people who are countering hate speech, are, are louder than the voices of those who are spreading hate speech. And as I told Aparna, it's really important that unfortunately most of the people are bystanders. You know, they are not spreading hate speech, but they are not also countering it. So the job of us who are trying to counter hate speech is actually to drag the bystanders to the side of somehow, you know, uh, counter it rather than, you know, let them go and spread hate speech. Because when we counter hate speech, we mostly work with the move movable middle. It's really hard to work with the people who are like really ex extreme in spreading hate speech. Like it's hard to convert them, but it's important to work with the movable middle and not let them go to spread hate speech, but rather put them on the side of countering it. Uh, but um I see that uh, Edda is raising her hand. Please, Edda, go ahead. I just wanted to add on something. Funny fact that um, I don't know why, but uh, I've been always experiencing the kind and quiet and sarcastic way of hate speech, always. And uh, you don't know how to react to that because it just happens as a 
like normal conversation or someone is being kind or nice to another one, but actually the words they are picking are very much shameful or like underestimating that person or actually, uh, I don't want to use it, but is worse than swearing or being loud to the other person. Um, how would you tackle anything like that? And it happens um, a lot uh, nowadays. Um, you know, like you can see it in a grocery shop, like two people having a conversation, but uh, maybe because of language ba barrier, um, the other person who is more independent in speaking that language actually, um, you know, using hateful hateful words to the other person but with a smiling face and you know kind kindness and very kind body posture but actually uh, she or he is committing hate uh, talk there so uh, yeah that, that was my uh, addition sometimes loud doesn't mean you are uh, doing something super negative being super quiet or in a nice or kind way um, can be the same no, you're right. Like hate speech comes in all forms. It comes in all shapes. It can be just a symbol. It doesn't even have to be a word. It doesn't have to be speech. It doesn't have to be a sentence. It can be just a symbol. I mean, the swastika symbol, obviously, you know, if you just put it into a certain context, there it is already. Uh, but uh as you said, like in hate speech, it doesn't have to be loud, you know, it can be also very well packed. And that's also a, a very great issue with hate speech and defining hate speech, because sometimes it's so very well packed that it's hard to pick and say, this is hate speech. Like you are using hate speech now. Uh, and that's this gray zone, which is really hard to tackle. And uh, sometimes it just stays there and it's really hard to counter it. It's really hard to do anything about it. So that's why I say that when when we speak about uh, how to, let's say, address hate speech, for me, the way of countering uh, in alternative narratives are the best way instead of fact checking, instead of, I don't know, uh, humor or satire. Because uh, if you create certain kind of alternative narrative, you're showing to people what you stand for instead of telling them what you're against it. Uh, let's say you are against hate speech, but you don't show like, uh, let's say a very uh, concretely, okay, I'm against hate speech. Like obviously, like most of the people are against hate speech, but you show people what you are for. You are, I don't know, for example, you are for solidarity or for equality, you are for equity, you are for inclusion, you are for helping out to people. And you really have to show that in, a, in an act that people understand that you are for that. So uh, either coming to, to, to certain places of worship that are not your places of worship, you are also showing to people you are open to diversity and you are showing that to your own community. And as Aparna said, it's really important that people who are prominent in the community, like, I don't know, other uh, religious leaders or um, local, let's say, counselors or uh, local policymakers, that they go to these kinds of, uh, of places or that they do these kinds of actions because they have the authority they have the uh the reach to the to the to the audience and they can somehow with these examples show okay we stand for this so there's no place for hatred in the, in this community so uh i think that people will always as i said to 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 aparna and uh, as, as it says haters gonna hate there will always be some people who will be hate who will hate people who will spread hate speech and i don't think we can get rid of hate speech like completely but it's just important that we are aware of it that we see it that we are not uh indifferent to it that as cinda says that we do, don't normalize it it's important that we don't normalize hate speech in our communities and it's also important that uh when hate speech occurs we do certain kind of action and say there's no place for hatred here it's not that we put those people who are spreading hatred in some kind of, uh, let's say, container and tell them like, uh -uh, you are not part of our community, but we tell them you are part of the community, but there is no place for this kind of behavior. There is place for all of us in the community, but certain behaviors won't be welcome here. But I am actually very interested in what was happening in the other group. <laughs> but I see Reshma, please go ahead. 
Yeah, so I I I have a kind of doubt. <laughs> I don't know if it's a doubt. Mm -hmm. Like uh um uh like in my community also like I have seen like hate speeches are coming up, but it's mostly like because of the stereotypes or prejudice we have. Like especially uh we don't know like um like how other religion is, but. Uh, but the religious leaders already have kind of their own like their own kind of judgments uh, related to other religions. So in such cases, like as a as a follower, I try to communicate with the uh, religious leaders, but then again it's failed. And sometimes it's also put us on danger. Like uh, they may say that okay, you are against our own religion so you are like having like kind of advocacy doing advocacy for other religions in such cases like how can we um like how can we find solutions do we have to keep silent or how can we talk in talk or something like that sometimes i feel like maybe like more frustrated and more angry but how can we control that situation? Like, do you experience such things or do you have any kind of solutions? Well, that's a very good good question. I'm not sure if I'm going to give you, like, the answer to, to, to it. Uh, but I think it's very important that, first of all, that you take care of you and that you take care of your own well-being and of also of, of your own uh, mental health. Because uh, sometimes... Uh, Countering hate speech can be quite uh, exhausting. It can be also quite exhausting seeing all those negativities, seeing all those examples, seeing all those people and asking yourself like, why, why, and why? So it's important if you are doing anything, don't do it alone. I think it's very important that you have a group of people who are, who are, who are doing things together with you. Uh, and I know that you are working a lot with young people. So it's important that you have allies in this kind of work. And if you can find, uh, let's say, uh, some people in the community that are influential in the community, they don't have to be religious leaders, but people who are having some kind of influence in the community that you can talk to and that you can, uh, let's say, have as an allies in your own work, that would be really good, like that can help you step by step. Obviously, sometimes obviously it's gonna it's not gonna happen over the over the night like uh you're not gonna get uh people over the night for your own cause uh like any other cause that you are doing especially interfaith dialogue in certain places it's really hard to do because people are afraid that i don't know entering one religious site is gonna convert them to to i don't know to christian to muslim to jew whatever uh, but my advice <laughs> because when i'm doing anything here i try to have people around me um, I try to uh, have uh, allies that can be uh, helpful and influential. Uh, and I try to be uh, not to burn out in this kind of, uh, of work because it's really important that you don't burn out. If you burn out, then nothing else will be important. You know, nothing else will matter. Uh, so take care of your mental health. Uh, take care also of your physical health. Um, if you think that you are going to be in danger with this, then it's maybe better to lay low for some time. And then after that, after you sense the situation, like is okay to act then to act because you don't want to be attacked as well. You don't want to be, uh, you know, target of hate speech. And sometimes I talk to certain religious leaders and even for them who are like, uh, one very prominent religious leader that I talked to uh, and that she was doing a lot of, of you know, uh, on tackling migrant issues, uh, on, on uh, welcoming the refugees. She was attacked by her own community that she is, you know, uh, I don't know, trying to, uh, you know, get the country overwhelmed with migrants. She's betraying the community. She's betraying them, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not easy always, but, uh, my also advice is if you are doing something like this, if you are tackling hate speech in your community, which is probably religiously diverse, it's also important to have people from different religious communities coming together. And as I said to a partner in our conversation, when something happens to one community, it's important that all the other communities come together and react because this is sending a powerful message. Because this is also sending that hate speech can happen to any one of us 
maybe today it happened to Christian community, maybe tomorrow will happen to the Muslim community, the day after tomorrow it will happen to Hindu community, etc., etc. So, as I already said, have people around you, don't do anything on your own, don't do it alone, and try to have diverse group around yourself, because if you want to spread, let's say, interfaith diversity, interfaith dialogue, you need to have people from different religions coming together. Otherwise, there's a question mark, like, why are you doing it if you're doing it alone? So that would be like my answer, my, my advice, but I'm, I'm sure I didn't tell you too many new things. You probably know most of these things, but um, uh, just don't burn out. <laughs> That's a, that's always a, a a problem and always an issue in this kind of work. Yeah, um, yeah, I already burned out like in two thousand nineteen. Then I'm like trying to then that actually eventually uh, helped me to create a coffee steam cafe. But actually, I was like really down with uh, what was happening around me. But now I'm like like okay, like okay, let it be some kind of thought but like that. But you also have the support of people who are not from yeah. your own community. So it's good that you have this kind of container, sort of mm -hmm. a container of people like Eda, like Cinde, like me, like any all of the people here in the community that you can talk to. And I think it's very important that people who are doing interfaith or any kind of work, uh, even like countering hate speech, it doesn't have to be religious based. It's important to have connections and, and, and community that you can rely on. Uh, because this gives you really hope and strength. And I know what it is to burn out. I had yes. this, unfortunately, in my own community as well. And many things are happening now in my country, which are somehow, you know, eroding all the work that was happening for 30 years on peace building. But uh, it's important not to to give up. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can uh, sort of Cindy raise her hand. No, I've just finished and then I will give the word to Cindy, please. Uh, no, I was like, we can listen to the other group because we just hear Aparna. So that's nice. Thank yeah, you. Cinder, go ahead. Right. Hi, thank you. Um, we, we had a really, really inter interesting um, uh, conversation. And Ono has given us a, uh, a link to read. Because initially I, I just said, you know, what would you do if somebody breaks your window? And what do you do? And we shared the stories that we had and I came up with a, <laughs> I'm going to test it out here because it's, it's, um, it almost sounds dangerous because <laughs> if somebody comes and breaks my window um, and I've had, I mean, maybe it's not a breaking window, but it's it, not in reality, but we do, peace work and you wouldn't you wouldn't believe how much hate mail I get people who says you're stupid you want disarmament they're gonna bomb the smithereens out of you <laughs> they'll come and kill your family things like that right really horrible <laughs> and um and I want I want really wanted to find out if there is a will amongst people to counter it by want by demanding a dialogue with them mm -hmm. tell me why you come to break my window mm -hmm. and i i hear you amina by saying that you know the people people are just undoing things that we've been doing for the past years and and we don't know why maybe because there is difficulties in in economics in polit in politics that they're so stressed that the only way that they have out is anger. And you can't be angry with your own people who speak your own language, do your own things. So you pick the other and just go at them, whether or not they are actually giving you grief or creating problems for you. Then the, the first thing you do, you, you pick people you can pick on. So you pick on the Syrians, you pick on people who, who are refugees because they can't fight you back. They're not organized. Um, it's like the Jews; they couldn't fall, they couldn't fight back. So let's go get them, and you can go get them en masse. Even there are millions of them. You can still go get them and kill them off, um, because they can't fight back. So, in encountering it, rather than 
then say that that's how you are and we're not like that. Might we exercise that compassion bit and say, why are you doing that? Please tell me. Treat me as being stupid or ignorant. Why? So Tima was saying that when they say things like that, they don't know what they're talking about because half the things they say may not even be true. Like, oh, because the the refugees are doing this, that, and the other. It may or may not be true. They they may or may not have the right information. We may not have the right information about them too. So if somebody acts in anger, um, it's almost like that transactional analysis that they are like a child. So we can't be trying to treat them as equals. So we play the parent part and say, okay, why are you angry? Now, you wouldn't do that if it's not your child. You would say, yeah, you're a bad child. But if you if you put yourself on that side of the fence and say, you're angry, why? Why? Tell me. And, and you know, hopefully if we understand that we don't do that to other people, like it's not good. Um, like the wars, I was saying, Putin doesn't talk to um, Biden. Biden doesn't want to talk to Putin either. He probably just wants to sell more arms <laughs> because everybody wants arms now. <laughs> um, but if there is a difference of opinion that already is breaking out in violence, either on speech, in mind, in physical reality, might we not try to formulate the countering um, format to find out why? In finding out why, we may not stop it, but at least we understand, we learn of the reasons. And some of those reasons are not unreasonable that perpetrated violence, that if we go back and we are more informed, then it's not just somebody but does something bad and you just kind of say, no, you're, bad. you're a bad person, you're evil. Before we say that, um, be educated about why they do what they do. Um, then can can that be formulated into a, a movement kind of thing that we counter it by asking why? You know. Okay. Is there a question? <laughs> Actually, I, I see Ed is raising her hand. So I don't comment, but I'm going to save it after you, Amina. Okay. Sorry, I don't know why. It, it was just a reflection. <laughs> Okay, now it's it's a very good question, Cindy, and I think many people in the interfaith movement now when we are talking about this are actually asking the question how to dialogue with the people who don't want to dialogue and how to actually uh, approach these people. And one answer that I got from one professor from the from the Canada, uh, Professor Patrice Bordeaux, he told me like in North America, we go where those people are. So you ask them for the dialogue table, they don't come. So you go to where the people are. So you really seek and try to talk to them. Maybe sometimes the doors will be closed, so you won't be able to talk. But maybe sometimes people will actually talk to you and you will get the answers on the questions. So that's why one of the things that I put in the presentation, like uh, one of the ways how to uh, address hate speech is showing also empathy towards the perpetrators, because you need to understand the reason behind hate speech. You need to understand why people are doing what they are doing in order to be able to counter it, because you won't make your counter or alternative narrative just like, okay, I'm going to just do this, but you understand, okay, there is a fear of the other. Okay, there is a fear of the other. I'm going to open the doors of my community and I'm going to show them who we are and what we are doing. So maybe that will decrease their fear. Or I don't know, there is a, um, a I don't know, I hate these people because uh, they are wearing this kind of clothes or whatever. So you ask them like, okay, why? And you show them why what these clothes means to you. I don't know, for example, speaking about hijab and, and everything was happening now in France and they are now actually trying to ban abaya. They don't want to let people, let Muslim girls wear abaya in the schools. And my question is like, 
besides the thing that France is obviously uh, breaching the Article 18 of the, you know, uh, on, on freedom of religion or belief, it's like, why you are banning Abaya? Like, what is happening in the society that people are afraid of Abaya? Maybe we need to work with the people in the society to understand for them why somebody is wearing Abaya, and the Abaya doesn't mean that I'm an extremist who is going to kill you one day. So it's really important. No, it's really important to, to, to educate people to understand why somebody is wearing hijab why somebody is wearing turban why somebody is wearing kirpan with with them or why somebody is i don't know practicing their religion this or that way so it's it's really important to understand these kinds of things and and to understand what lies behind this logic except also that there are sometimes governmental and, and political political reasoning behind certain things but uh when we speak about lay people like about citizens in, inside the society i think it's important that we talk about education education and education i can't emphasize education and 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 just visiting certain communities learning about the communities visiting places of worship and just showing to people that you know we are just normal people like you are we just do things a little bit differently and that that doesn't make us deadly that doesn't make us terrorist killers or whatever so as it, it, to answer your question, yes, it's important to ask people why they are afraid, why they are doing what they are doing. And it's important to understand the reason behind the hatred if we want to somehow counter it. So coming, coming back to that, if we are going to engage with, with people who have these, these kind of hate speech, to engage them, obviously, um, if we're going to go amongst them, uh, there is a certain level of of tension. Of course, um, there's security um, concerns. Is that something in your experience, Amina, that that the religious leaders are about to do? I mean, if if you want to go into some some really difficult and and gritty um, discussion, and mm -hmm. we don't want to shy away and just make everything okay, we want the the real um, tension. To come to a fore, but try to to talk it so that we can have a difficult conversation, civil in in a civil manner. Th that takes a very strong-handed moderator, that both sides um, respect. Yes. And when when we find that and find, I mean, there are so many discussions that needs to happen, so that at least the younger generation has has a chance to le learn that. Because for people who are older, they already have a, a pre preconceived ideas and, and preconceptions. But for young people, they, they are seeing each other anew. They have a lot a lot more in common. Like, say, for example, they all, all, all use handphones. They all play games. They all know all the social media. Their, their common language is a lot better than people my age because we all grew up so differently. Young people nowadays, because of the of the openness of the internet, they have a lot more in common, although they have different backgrounds. So might we not make that a chance to get the young people to have that kind of conversation based on that kind of approach to either social media or to um, global understanding and seek out these strong moderators so that we can carry on some important but tense conversations and that is the starting point of mutual understanding we may never agree with each other but that doesn't matter you know i know about you and and vice versa and that that knowing even if there it doesn't carry acceptance it carries understanding and that makes that that cools out cools down the tension. I think. I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm proposing to put that into <laughs> into experiment to see whether that actually works or not. <laughs> well, I think that the thing is that there is something that might start happening because I don't see it happening already. I don't mm -hmm. see many difficult conversations happening at the same time. Uh, at, at this time, and uh, I don't see a lot of those strong moderators who will be able to lead these kinds of conversations. I had a few of those very difficult conversations in my work with mm -hmm. young people in Bosnia coming from different ethnic backgrounds, then had 
a lot of issues in the past. And that really requires a lot of strength, mental strength, and a lot of, you know, willingness to continue. Uh, but I think this is a model that it's worth experimenting. And this is something that we might try to implement into interfaith movement because interfaith movement is, is not, I would say, is not uh, open enough to these kinds of conversations. We talk too much about similarities but we don't talk a lot about the differences that we have and we don't have enough difficult conversations. But I think I see some bright examples among, among the religious leaders as well, but they are like really rare. So I think this is something that can start happening, but it, it will take <laughs> some time. But I see Greshma and um, I see Ed, and probably they want to tell us that the we have to wrap up because we are already four minutes behind. So um, I'm I'm now giving the word to you, uh, Greshma and and Edda. Uh, yeah, like uh, yeah, I really want to mention that when Cindy says about the young people, and what I really like uh, really found these days, and when working with young people, uh, like um, then. Um, when I was a child or I was going to the school, I never identified myself with the religion or never looked for what religion my friends are. But these days when I'm working with teenagers through a coffee scene cafe and also like my brother is 10 years younger than me. So uh, when I talk to him, like they are like really identified themselves with the religion and they are also seeing other religion as other. Like even they are seeing um, not just friends, but they belong to this religion. So I always try to have this difficult conversation with my brother and as an interfaith peace builder, like I always say like, why you say their religion? Like he is your friend, but why you see the religion first? So he was like, I think like the in uh, maybe the internet or movies they are seeing and also the uh, like the conversation from the religious leaders they are really influenced by such conversations and also what's happening in my country and also globally like what's happening is really influenced them and also I can see the fears in um, in all the children like how they have a feeling that okay in, in the future they might be attacked because of what they are believing so it's so high in the young people also like uh, when we are saying like the elders are more concerned about the religion but no like in the in, in the ground level the children is also like really getting influenced by what they are seeing through the internet or their social media so that's why we need to talk about how to hate the counter speech and like how to counter the hate speech and also find solutions uh, to this kind of talks and and bridging the gaps between and trying to see like uh, see and respect other religions also yeah i just want to mention that thank you and over uh, to you Edda. Oh. sorry sorry Edda. very quickly is is that if if starting from the religion is not a good place to start mm -hmm. let's dump it uh, let's be the person first before we talk about religion because as, as soon as you know each other you are already holding yourself into a corner Mm -hmm. to be different to be different to, to be disagreeable to each other i mean that's that that's a stupid place to start right uh you, you need to start in the place instead of through different faith you come together and you say we're we're the same we're not the same we don't want to, we don't try to be the same so let's start in a different place and understand each other in the differences sorry Ada, you go i was actually about to mention the same thing cindy but bringing in similarities because we don't need to invent something new we just need to look back to past history that has been uh, i'm not saying this is the only way it may be one way in different topics because uh, hate speech happens in different versions you know it can be uh, through um, nationalities it can be race everything um but um what I wanted to say was that education is the key, yes, but maybe um, sometimes we need to uh, cross our barriers and uh, cross whatever uh, uh, school is giving to us or our families are giving to us and try to be 
ourselves and our identity. I really do believe the saying that uh, children are mirrors of their parents. Uh, or uh, tell me your who, who your friend is. I'm going to tell you who you are. So um, we tend to follow others or, you know, uh, whatever we hear, whatever we see, but actually... Are you have you educated yourself to know in depth what they are talking about? What is your own truth? What what would you like to follow? Not maybe the other person that is saying, oh, wearing hijab is so um, different, and why would you do that? Is horrible, you know. But uh, maybe trying to understand what why that person is doing that, or I don't like you because there have been wars always among us. Most of the wars, when you look into them, when you look social side of the wars, people are actually um, against uh, sides. They are together and they are trying to hold on to those hardships together, and. Um, um, that that is just tiny addition I wanted to put in. Perhaps you need to study more, understand more, ask questions, rather than taking whatever is available there uh, already is there, but finding your own truth and your understanding, and uh, you know breaking your barriers basically. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Greshma. Oh, no, sorry. One more thing. Ha! I'm so sorry. It's me. I'm the culprit. I want to, if, if we're talking about education, if we're talking about learning about each other, I want the young people to tell us what they want to learn. I want people like Tima, like Ono, like Amila, like Apana, to tell us what it is that they want to find out about each other. Because I'm done with educating people. I want the education to be an, a mutual thing. Because if if not, I'm coming to tell you what you can do. Well, it doesn't work because everybody, everyone is different. So in in talking to Tima, I would need to understand where she comes from, her country, the politics, the, the situation, who she's looking at. And each situation gives us a deeper sense of compassion to understand other people. So it's not me going to tell her, we need to do this, we need to do that. It's her coming to me and say, this is what's happening. And it would be good if we know each other so that we don't, you know, so that we don't hate each other because I don't want to hate them. And I don't know why I have to hate them because everybody seems to say, get rid of the Syrians, things like that. So I, there is a, that body of work isn't what we do. It's actually making that platform so that they can come and tell us what they need to know in order to get rid of that suspicion or, or the, the paranoia that comes so yeah we we need people we we don't need a, an educator we need a very good we need a very good facilitator but we we need people who are interested and willing to take on the take this on rather than us making something and mm, we give it to you sorry Rashma. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And Emina, do you want to share like one minute closing reflection? And after that, maybe we can close the session. Okay, we are 11 minutes behind, so I don't want to take you for too long. I just want to tell you like, treat hate speech as a symptom. Don't treat it as a cause. There are many, many causes behind why we use hate speech. And if you are out to counter hate speech, think what is causing it and why people behave the way they behave. And uh, in preparing your alternatives, in preparing your uh, ways how to counter it, think of your context, think of the people who are spreading it, and think also of the ways how you can best reach people with your messages. And the final thing, um, take care of yourself, take care of your mental health, and don't burn out in this kind of work. Uh, because world needs you, we need you, and we need to stick together and we need to work together if we want to counter hate speech, which is unfortunately every day just rising and rising because of the situation in, in, in the world. So, uh, and don't, uh, don't be desperate because I'm sure there are much more people who are against hate speech rather than pro hate speech. It's just important that we find them 
and that we find a way how to how to talk to them. And I'm going to close here and give the word to Grashma and let you go because we are already 30 minutes behind. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Emina. And you wonderfully uh, like said it, like how uh, how to take the hate speech like a symptom, not a cause. So we need to treat the symptoms and like also treat the causes. So let's join together for action. And as part of this uh, session, we will have a action workshop very soon. We will share the details very soon. So thank you so much, Emina, for taking this time and spending your uh, evening with us and sharing this valuable information and inspire us to take action against the hate speech. So once again, thank you so much from RFP UK and uh, RFP UK and UK IYN Echo Peace Cafe team. And thanks to all participants with compassion, love, friendliness, and graceful. We are here with you all to uh, counter hate speech and let's do our work and see you soon. And thank you. Good evening and good night to all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.